you know, in one in one case, you can distribute economic energy to billions and billions of people, billions of times an hour, and that is something of wonder. You know, in one in one case, you can distribute economic energy to billions and billions of people, billions of times an hour, and that is something of wonder. And in the other case, you can store a billion dollars of energy in a battery for a hundred years and still have the energy. And we don't have any other credit or cash or asset instrument or property instrument where you could store a billion dollars of economic energy for a hundred years without dissipating it. It's just a question of how fast, right? In gold, you dissipate 90% of it in a hundred years. In fiat, like US dollars, you dissipate 98%, 99% in a hundred years. In electricity, like literal electrical energy, you dissipate a hundred, no one can store that much electrical energy for a hundred years. You dissipate it all. It's all gone, right? Even, we even ran into this issue with uh, oil, like chemical energy or natural gas. They had this situation last year where they're pumping oil to the ground and the oil price went negative because there's nowhere to store the oil, right? Like once you run out of containers or, or tanks to store the oil, you got to pour it on the ground every single form of energy or form of, of um, property is challenging to move to store over time. And Bitcoin solves that problem. So you want to you wanna empower 8 billion people. You need a monetary network that, that can reach all of them at an economic cost. And I think lightning on top of Bitcoin and or there's other layer three apps, right? I mean, you, you can do centralized solutions like Square Cash app or something like that. And, and they also have exponentially decreasing transaction costs uh, that you get by accepting counterparty risk. But if you accept the central Bitcoin bank and you make Google or Apple or Facebook or Square or PayPal that Bitcoin bank, you can still move a billion transactions an hour, almost frictionless. And so, so that Bitcoin offers the promise of super con monetary superconducting. Like it's, it's like in a superconducting network, when you get the temperature at a low enough level, there's no friction anymore and you can do some pretty amazing things. That's what we have in Bitcoin or maybe call it, it's like weightlessness. If I actually took you into a, a weightless orbit and I can all of a sudden push a million pounds with a, a finger, interesting things happen. And I, I think that's what we have here. We, it's, it's a major breakthrough. And I, I think of it as, I think it is the next logical evolution of energy. Electrical engine, electrical energy was a big deal. When we had mechanical energy, we had to put, uh, you know, a mill was built around a turbine and if, and then we got to electrical energy and you didn't have to build it around the turbine anymore. You could spread out the plant across 18 acres because you can move electricity uh, up and down in, in, in multiple dimensions and, and in space. But with digital energy, you know, I, I'm not limited to a plant. I can move the energy through time and space a million times more efficiently. So the kinds of structures that you could build and the kind of things you could do are now exponentially, uh, exponentially more efficient. I think, I think it naturally follows, right? Digital energy, digital property, digital money is the, is the greatest utilitarian asset the greatest utilitarian value or the greatest utilitarian asset on the greatest utilitarian network in the world, in the history of the world. Um, and uh, that means for 8 billion people, right? It, it offers the possibility of economic empowerment. I think, uh, if you want to give if you want to give joy to 8 billion people 
you need digital music. And if you want to give education or, or enlightenment to 8 billion people, you need digital books or digital education. And if you want to give wealth to 8 billion people, you need digital property, digital money, right? And um, there is no other, uh, there's nothing else that offers that promise, right? Over something like the Lightning Network to 8 billion mobile devices, and the, and the mobile devices cost $50. So the ability to give uh, economic energy to 8 billion people on a $50 device and do it with integrity and do it with no friction. Right? Like you're, when you're moving stuff on the Lightning Network, you're moving it for one Satoshi. So it's friction free, speed of light at any scale, $37, $37,000, $37,000,000, dollars you know, at any frequency. Right, like I want to, I want to vibrate something, right? As Tesla, Tesla's point about understand frequency. If I have a billion dollars of gold, I put it in the vault. The frequency is like once every 10 years. That's the velocity of the money. If I have a billion dollars and I put it in the fiat currency and move it over the Visa rails and the Fed wire, then it takes one to two months to move it. Every time I, if I make a charge transaction before final settlement, you know, it's gonna be 30 days before you know that you're not gonna get clawed back in another 15 days or something. So, so 45 to 60 days after I pay you for something, you can move it. So you're talking about velocity of six per year, annual velocity of six per year. I put the same money on, on the Bitcoin Lightning Network and the velocity is six, per minute, six, six per second, six per hour, right? You're talking about uh, a velocity which is orders of magnitude higher. And then of course the cost is, the Visa network is 2%, 2.5% friction. Cost to move a billion dollars of transactions, $25 million. The cost to move that on the Lightning network, if you break it into like, a hundred thousand transactions is going to be a hundred thousand satoshis, right? So there's nothing comparable, right? It's a revolutionary transaction network, and it's also a revolutionary uh, monetary network. I think that the only reason to uh, to pursue a patent, in my opinion, and this is this is my opinion over the course of a thirty year career is the only reason you get a patent is defensively so you can defend yourself against patent trolls when they sue you. And I've used it over and over again. Like there are people with one patent and they just sue for a living. It's like someone finds out that you use mathematics on a phone or you use the color green in your interface and they show up saying that they use math and the color green in your software and they want 10% of your company. And then you have to defend yourself. And it turns out in our legal system, the, the best way to defend yourself is to knock out their patent by having a prior claim or a different related patent. And so, so defensive portfolios of patents make sense. I'm, am I a fan of patents? Not really. No, if I could wave my hand, I would eliminate all patents because I think they're restraints of trade. And I don't really think that the society is served by by people laying claim to the right. I have an idea to do something. Well, yeah, so like everybody in the human race has ideas and sometimes people have the same idea twice. So why should you be able to prevent every other human from starting a fire? Or my idea is start a fire just before it starts raining and pretty soon someone's trying to tell you you gotta freeze to death because you wanna start a fire before it rains. I, I'm not a big fan of them, uh, you know? And so if we got rid of them all, the world would be a better place. But in a world where we can't get rid of them, then accumulating them to defend sovereignty is useful. And uh, putting together like the, the crypto patents uh, as part of COPA, the COPA initiative is, is primarily a defensive one. It's a useful thing to do.